Welcome to Ball and Play, presented by Baseball News Club. We cover everything with a ball and stick around the world. We cover Major League Baseball, to International, Dominican, Australian, to Korean. We also cover NCAA Baseball Division I and softball, all the way on down, Little League softball, to T-ball. We cover over the line, wiffle ball, anything with a ball and stick. We will cover it here at Ball and Play. Please stop right now. I need you to subscribe. Please comment and also turn on your notifications. Thank you very much. And let's get started with this journey we call baseball. Okay, welcome to Ball and Play Episode 3. Thank you very much for watching and thank you very much on all of our downloadable podcasts followers for downloading our podcast really appreciate it uh, we're located pretty much everywhere uh, itunes i mean there's just a millions of different places but where we're really located is on ig uh, baseball news club uh, daily that's the best thing to follow because we're posting stuff on our stories non-stop related to anything with the ball and stick and then also we're on youtube that's where we have a lot of videos we just posted some light videos for the dominican so again go check us out uh, please comment on the video check out our links our links will take you right to our social media pages so again thank you very much for your support let's get this going we got a lot of stuff on the table uh, we're gonna be talking heavy cba uh, baseball mlb just came out this past thursday with an announcement about the status of the cba good and bad news with that but we're going to dive right into that and go deep into that a rod a rod's back in the news i always got to talk about him sometimes i don't know why he just always seems to it's like a fly to a light He's always going to be attracted to it. Um, Mike Trout. We're talking a little bit about Mike Trout. Top 25. Okay, the girls softball haven't really came out with a comprehensive top 25 yet. But we're going to go over the top 15 pitchers in the NCAA Division I for girls softball this year. We're going to run through that list. There's some pretty insane pitchers on that list. Um, we're also going to go into Ronald Acuna news. Yeah, there's some news about Ronald Acuna. Uh, Orioles. Um, Shohei. Phillies, we're actually going to break down the divisions month to month from last year and show how competitive the league was throughout the season. But um, let's go ahead and jump right into it. First thing we're going to talk about, I just want to get it out of the way. Uh, well, actually, two things. Uh, I apologize about Allie Retchman from the Beavers, who's playing for the Orioles, who I was predicting is going to be their catcher in 2022. I said he was a left-hander. I know he's a switch hitter. I don't know why I said that. He's a switch hitter, so I apologize to the beaver fans out there and oriole fans um i actually was listening to the podcast again and i heard it and i was like crap i'm not gonna go all the way back and just edit that one little spot so i left it in there my apologies um so that was the news and then also uh abrod again he's he's in the news always but he was trying to get an apartment 10 million dollar co-op deal approved after a tantrum a rod through tantrum the guys having a rough last 12 months gets dumped by j-lo Getting dumped by MLB, uh, pretty much getting pushed out. But supposedly, according to the realdeal.com, he threw a tantrum. This is a prestigious Central Park West building. A lot of famous people live there. In fact, a few years ago, if you remember 2018, there was a famous photo of him taking a dump on a toilet in the apartment he was sharing with his then uh, fiance, JLo. But uh, yeah, he wanted that apartment so bad, he threw a tantrum. And accordingly, he begged the board. So the co-op board, he begged them. Uh, they said they didn't want him in there because of his reputation. So that was initially why he got rejected, but he kept begging and he got in there. So, hey, Rod, still just a drama queen, I swear. Let's move on to some other news. Okay, in other news, uh, signing of international prospects started on the 15th. So if you haven't noticed uh, since the 15th of January, you're seeing just a whole bunch of news from your team and Twitter and you know all the other social media things about oh this player is signed international this player is signed international so it's kind of like it's kind of confusing because you're like hey it, I thought we had the CBAs locked out right now well international signings still go on uh, that's a big deal right now and in fact uh, Ronald Acuna yeah Ronald Acuna's little brother is actually being looked at by the Twins uh, the Twins haven't totally announced it but they reportedly reached a deal with the venezuelan shortstop brian acuna b-r-y-a-n brian acuna 
He's MLB's Pipeline's number 39th prospect in the international class. He's the youngest brother of the Braves outfielder who actually, if you've been following us on our Instagram, uh, there's video of Ronald Acuna taking batting practice. He looks great. He's supposedly back to normal. Everything looking great for Ronald Acuna, but hey, his brother is in the pipeline. He's going to be coming up, and if you listened to our podcast last week, we talked about Juan Soto's little brother. Um, also in the pipeline, Washington is going to end up signing him and keeping him in their organization. So interesting, and it kind of ties into the CBA. We're going to dive into that a little bit because the owners want to they're really fighting giving more money to younger players but we're going to go into that but let's move on to some other news real quick okay now we always talk about how we uh we lift up other social media other places uh there's a youtube channel i've been following for over the last year year and a half i love their channel uh they put up great content but you've got to go there and look at yourself it's called baseball does not exist it's on youtube probably the most underrated baseball channel out there they do absolutely fantastic research absolutely fantastic editing it's about once a month they put out a video but go check that out again i don't think they really need my help uh you know advertising them but it's a channel i love to follow i have a ton of channels i like to follow on social media and youtube baseball related i couldn't even tell you how long the list is but that's one channel i consistently look out for uh, that I love to watch their videos, and it's great stuff. It's very unique stuff, but it's also stuff uh, the writers of ba- baseball does not exist. They do really good research, and it's very detailed. So I highly encourage you to go check that out. Okay, in other news, uh, we're going to talk about Mookie Betts. We all know Mookie Betts is a fabulous bowler. Uh, he actually is p- participating in the bowling championships, uh, supposedly just a week or two ago. Um, he bowled a 300, which I guess that's perfect in bowling. I'm sorry if I don't know bowling. It's just something I never got into, but um, he's an awesome bowler, and bowling a perfect score is extremely difficult. I even tried on my video games. I can't do it, but uh, he bowled, bowled a 300, and it's not the first time he's done this. Um, he's done it multiple times. You can find him at Mookie Betts uh, as his tag or his handle for Instagram. Go check it out. I mean, he was, I mean, he's up to almost 50,000 likes on it, uh, but he's been competing for a while it's kind of funny to see Mookie holding a bowling ball but he's he kicks ass in it and he's been competing in it for for years so good luck to Mookie that's awesome news I like Mookie killing it with bowling but here's the thing if I'm uh, the Dodgers I'm being all serious I don't need Mookie healthy this year I need Mookie playing 150 plus so honestly I don't want him bowling I get it but you know you're paying the guy a ton of money I get he's good at bowling. Hey, if he's able to play bowling for a full season, then, or even if in the championships he's competing in, I'm just saying for the Dodgers that that is something I saw a lot with the Dodger Nation uh, in comments and social media. Not too happy with Mookie. They need him healthy. He was up and down all t- 2021, but he needs to come back full on 150 plus games if the Dodgers are going to get their money's worth out of him. I apologize. Let's move on to other news, but it's the PBA championship for Mookie. Sorry, I had to look it up. Uh, Baltimore Orioles news. They reveal or unveil, I hate prefixes, um, new left field plan at Camden Yards. Source, Baltimore Sun. Check it out. They're moving in. Uh, they're moving back the walls. And what's very interesting about that is that's going to lead us into players to trade is Trey Mancini. What are they going to do with Trey? Yeah, they're doing these changes in Baltimore. It's nice, but you still haven't addressed your pitching. But let's go into a, a subject I want to talk about right now. Let's move on to some other news. Well, we're going to dive into the CBA a little bit and players to be traded. Uh, top 15 college softball pitchers to watch in 2022. Uh, Montana Fouts of Alabama. Uh, she had 349 strikeouts last year. Just dominant. She finished a 1.61 ERA and rank, ranked in the top 10 with 10 shutouts. Uh, there's a lot on this list. Again, these are top 15. Catherine Sandercock of Florida State. Uh, she had a 1.25 ERA. That's just unbelievable, man. Uh, Gabby Plain of Washington is also picked to be a top pitcher this year. Um, she led the NCAA uh, with 32 victories last year and uh, 337 strikeouts. Man, that's just... Phew. She's a Pac-12 pitcher of the year. And then, of course, Tennessee. I mean, come on, Ashley Rogers. I mean, <laughs> how dominant can you be on the mound? Um She's been pretty fantastic. She can strike out like crazy. Um, She's going to be in the top in there. And then Mary Half of Arkansas, of course, she's going to be in there. And then Megan 
Ferramo of UCLA. Keep an eye on her. Um, she had the best ERA in the Pac-10 at 1.10 ERA. Uh, top 10 in the NCAA. She's she's hurling it. Uh, Kelly Maxwell of Oklahoma State's on the list. Uh, Valerie Cagle, Clemson. She's on the list. Top 15 pitchers to keep an eye on. Uh, Keely Rochard of Virginia Tech. Elizabeth Hightower of Florida. Um, Jordan Bell of Oklahoma. And, uh, dude, she, uh, in high school, she was just insane. Uh, 27 0 in high school with a 0.10 ERA. Yeah. And then you got Georgina Corick of South Florida, also on there. Brooks Yanez of Oregon for the Ducks. Uh, Danielle Williams of Northwestern's on there. Alex Storecchio of Michigan. And if you want to see more about this, just go to NCAA.com. Uh, it's uh, Michelle Chester. She just wrote this article uh, last week. So for those of you into college softball, there you go. Here's some updated news. Again, I don't have a really comprehensive top 25 for the girls. We went over the uh, top 25 last week for uh, girls. So for men, excuse me. So we'll be going to update the top 25 for the women shortly. Let's move on. Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is uh, Philadelphia Phillies. They are looking to sign one of their international shortstop talents. Now, we've I'm not been hard on them, but I, you know, hold the hold their feet to the fire. Dame Dombrowski, the president of baseball operations for Philadelphia Phillies, announced he wants to focus on pitching in the outfield. Thus far, he hasn't done that. Max Scherzer got signed. He hasn't really done anything, and now they're signing an international shortstop, which doesn't make sense because they have their their shortstop they've been that's been in their minors that they're kind of were predicting was going to be their starting shortstop this year uh, brian stott s-t-o-t-t -T. so now you've got brian who is going to be your future shortstop and now you're signing an international starts shortstop but you're still not signing what you said you needed to do is the pitching and the outfielding so i'm a phillies fan i thought they were a good team last year i thought just with a little bit more uh tweaking to their rotation and some players they should have been right in there in the mix in the playoffs and they're a team that I think is right on the bubble. They can go downhill and they can go uphill. But the president of baseball operations, I mean, I think Dave Dombrowski, this is a big season for him. His feet are under the fire. And it just, I'm not, you know, when we talk about how we judge teams in the offseason, we look the day after the World Series, what goes on. And we've already talked about this past podcast, how a lot of teams already made moves, spent money. The Mets are one of them. But when you're looking at the Phillies, who barely didn't make it Seattle Mariners who barely didn't make it those are the teams I'm kind of keeping an eye on like what are you doing in offseason right now to get yourselves up to be competitive for 2022 Dave Dombrowski came out and said I'm gonna focus on outfield and pitching Philly fans I don't know talk to me comment and let me know what your fans think is Dave the right guy for Philadelphia now again I might be putting the cart before the horse because with the CBA right now once that ends you're gonna see just a, a rush of signings but Come on, guys. We got uh, pitchers and catchers reporting around Valentine's Day. Uh, today is the 18th. It's less than a month away. We're going to have to wait and see, but we're going to talk about CBA in a little bit. But let's move on to some other news. So in the news this week, also, it was Shohei Otani. And I, I don't like talking about this guy because I think he's a horrible announcer. Stephen A. Smith of ESPN. Stephen A. kind of said some racist comments or some very negative comments about Shohei. Shohei's had one of the greatest seasons in Major League history. Well, Shohei was on GQ Magazine and uh, wearing a really cool like red sweater. It kind of looked like the old 1910s. But this is what Shohei said verbatim. And I quote, I came here to play baseball at the end of the day and I felt like my play on the field could be my way of communicating with people, with the fans. That's all it really took from that in the end. So Shohei pretty much is classy, doesn't fall in, doesn't take the bait by Stephen Smith. Um, we all know Stephen Smith is just, he's just one of those guys that, come on man, let's get to, he doesn't fit in the baseball realm. He tries to talk baseball, but he just doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's just one of those, I guess you can say personalities, um, you know, with the ESPN that just drives you crazy. And it's just, it, I think sports starting to get away from that more and more. You see with the way we look at A-Rod and the way we look at Stephen Smith, a lot of baseball is getting away from those type of people because you're just looking at them going, you're really just kind of winging it. You really don't know the sport. You're really just there to because you're a personality on, on ESPN. So again, it's just, I don't want to wait too much time on him because I don't like Stephen A. Smith. Um, he doesn't even follow baseball. 
Um, and he's been criticized in the past for not understanding baseball. So if you're going to take on Shohei, man. You got to bring more than that, Stephen Smith. Got to bring more than that. But with that, it's almost a way of him getting into just to be attached to Shohei. You know how that is with social media nowadays. People just say negative things just so they can bring a light and attention to themselves. They're piggybacking or ambulance chasing the real subject. And a good example is when the lockout started. Saw a lot of chicken littles. A lot of people just complaining and going crazy. And it's like, you know what? Don't be a follower. Stop and think. Look at what's going on. Yeah, you're not missing much. You're missing the winter meetings. You're missing the Rule 5 draft with no one out there ever pays attention to the Rule 5 draft. So don't go lying to me. Um, and please comment as I go through all these topics. Please comment about each individual topic or whatever, or whatever topic that you wish to comment on. So again, we're going to move on, but it's just one of those things where the sport is changing. Uh, we're getting away from those. The sport's getting better. The sport's been fantastic. 2021 was an absolutely great season. And I think that's why a lot of people are frustrated with the lockout right now. Remember, there's never been one regular season game missed the lockout. I know there's people right now panicking, thinking that we're going to miss regular season games. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit more because the, they had conversations on Thursday. A lot of good information came out kind of what i've been talking about the last couple of podcasts of what they're focusing on revenue sharing is obviously the top of the theme but the owners are pushing back on certain things which we expected but there's a couple cookies in there that we're going to go over okay so let's just dive into cba this past thursday it was announced that everyone got together the powers that be uh, the owners the, you know the players association the union you know everything everyone got together via zoom and i find this really hilarious because i could just see Rob Manfred getting a email to go down in the link and click on the Zoom and join the meeting. I bet you he clicked on it the first time he got and was in there by himself and was like, why am I the only one in this meeting? Because, Rob, it's set for Thursday. You clicked on it on a Monday. No one's there, Rob. So I just see Rob messing that up. But I just think it's funny that at this level of billions of dollars being discussed that you're going to get an email to click on a link for a meeting. I just, I just find it hilarious. Um, I'm sure that's how it happened. But anyhow, uh, the league's new proposal, significant increase in pay for players at two years of service time. Now, the big pushback with the owners, and this was pre-lockout, uh, the owners pushed out a lot on younger players making more money. That's always been kind of their bugaboo right now. And that ties into something called um, Super 2 eligibility. Super 2 eligibility is one of the things that they're, not seeing eye to eye with with the players association right now that's where the top 20 if you're under three years of service uh you don't have an opportunity for salary arbitration because you haven't been around three to six years you have you don't have an opportunity for free agency because you don't have six years of service you don't have the tenure but with the super two eligibility they take the top 22 percent of players that season and then they could be eligible for arbitration that's an area that the owners are really pushing back on. And we've talked about in prior podcasts, there's a ton of talent coming up the pipeline. It was proven by the play this year. Uh, you look at the Tatises, the Acunas. I mean, both Soto and Acuna's little brothers are coming up. Uh, just look at the whole league and all the talent going on. Uh, you can look at every single team has some type of super talent being built. And I think a lot of that is young talent. And the owners are just trying to see, I think they see how the sport is growing. There's a lot of money out there, but they're also seeing these younger talents getting that money. And they don't, I think the owners realize there's a ton of young talent coming up the pipeline. And they're going to be paying more money down the road. So that is one thing they've been pushing back on. But a significant increase in play uh, for players to your service time. So they're agreeing to give them an extra, but the one thing that they talked about was a six-year free agency, uh, Super 2 eligibility, uh, players with at least 10 years of Major League Service, also they, on the 10 and 5. So after being five consecutive seasons with one team and 10 years of service, you can go into free agency. Um, now, now, also they can veto, when you get 10 years of service, you can veto any trade proposals. So you can kind of see throughout... The length of time you earn all these perks in major league baseball for playing a long time uh but the players are pushing back on the fact that you know like i talked about last week they want a fair and exciting game and it's hard to have a fair and exciting game when you're 
not allowing these younger players to make money that they they deserve and the owners don't want to give away a lot of money early it makes sense look at Pujols what happened in LA come on guys the guy got a ton of money didn't do crap not exactly the same scenario but I you got to look at it from the owner's point of view they're just going you know what I don't want to give a big contract to somebody who might flop on me and then we're stuck with it makes sense but you know what I think as owners you know if these some of these players are really good um, obviously Acuna is worth the money Tatis is worth the money Soto's worth the money you know even Bryce Harper's not that he's not old but Bryce Harper's worth the money so you got all this crop of young talent it makes sense you know and that's what the owners are seeing that this pipeline of new players coming up they got too much talent and it, it frightens them um now again we Jeff Passan came out this week and made a comment too and the thing is with the CBA that cracks me up is when I heard Thursday's news that they met by Zoom was one of the first times I'm thinking the whole time that they're like you ever see Godfather like every time they meet there's a bunch of heads of the families in one room and they're they talk it out that's kind of what I was assuming was going on uh, but it sounds like they're just all taking a little vacation and they met by Zoom but what's good news and the what I get with the takeaway with it is it wasn't anything like no way are we coming together on this we're gonna strike there's not that language going on this is still talking money and there's some things little gems that came out that I, I think we need to pay attention to a couple little gems that I was like ooh in the statement from Thursday when I read this there was a couple gems that really lit my ears up because there was certain keywords that came up that was like hey they're talking about expanded playoffs DH they are agreed upon on those areas so that's very interesting um, but again owners before the lockout did not want to talk about revenue sharing they didn't want to talk about increase to free agency and salary arbitration earlier because salary arbitration should be happening right now but with the lockout it's not so they don't want players being free agents earlier and they don't want them being able to be eligible for salary arbitration I mean it's only three years I mean I get it but it just tells you where they're at the owners and the players in regards to negotiation that their players say they're nitpicking and in a way this is kind of nitpicking I mean you only need two or three years there's some other logistics that goes into the super two eligibility so I'm just kind of generalizing because there's some games that you have to play and stuff like that but the fact that they're nitpicking that going hey we don't want to pay these younger players more money and allow them salary arbitration man that's a tough call man because it, let's say you get two two years in you have two great starting seasons you know uh it doesn't even really matter your age at that point you've got the numbers you should deserve an increase in pay you know if if i work a job right now and have a great 12 because most jobs run 12 month reviews if i kick ass my job i'm gonna get a pay raise at the end of the year most likely unless there's some weird politics going on in that job and this is what they're kind of talking about i think players are trying to say hey if we have a good one season we should get a pay raise for that well players let me argue this if you have a shitty season the next season should you lose pay and i think that's kind of the angle the owners are looking at they're going yeah we hear you but it's a lot for us to just give up and i, I get both sides again i'm playing devil's advocate as an owner you're just going hey it's a lot of money here not sure I really want to fork this out for such a young talent or a player that's only proven himself one or two seasons because what about their flop I get that that's a big deal but hey if you do a contract incentive laden contract and performance you know if you give a base pay and then give a lot of performance that's how you do the contracts okay yeah you're young you've only got two or not even young let's say you got two great seasons now you want salary arbitration well here's what we offer you we increase your pay uh, a little bit but what more so is we'll give you performance incentives so we'll pay you for your first those two seasons we'll give you extra money for your, all this great stuff you did but moving forward how about we just talk about a base pay and some performance incentive so if you hit this number or that you hit this many hits or whatever then we'll pay you more that makes sense but again this is the conversations going on uh, i'm just throwing it out there but again if jeff passan has no clue it tells you how secretive these things are um, I haven't heard anything other than Jeff Passan just basically doing what I'm doing just agreeing with what's going on and even he he's one of the best contacts I think out there for MLB news 
he doesn't have a clue what's going on right now, really. So, I mean, he does, but he doesn't. If you understand my drift, he doesn't know fully what's happening. So it's very curious. But one thing I want to get into, Major League Baseball offered proposals this week for stuff where they already had common ground. And again, this is the wording I'm talking about. They have common ground. That means they've agreed on this. What areas have they already agreed on? Uh, how about designated hitter? Playoffs. Yeah. And also players talking about the draft in order to address concerns of tanking. Now, this is very interesting because this is common ground. That means they've come to an agreement on DH and playoffs. So it's just a little bit of tweaking going on. But one thing I like about the players, because the players, I've told you guys about this in past, po past podcasts, is they want a competitive game. They want a fun game on the field. That's what they're talking about. And when you have manipulation of player service time, which is a big part of the Players Association's grievance right now, and then also draft. So you look at Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah, they got a great minor league system, but it's all these drafts. It's a different type of take. Look at the Atlanta Braves uh, minor league organization. You're probably like, oh, there's, they're not ranked that high as Pittsburgh in one of the best minor leagues, but they come out, they bring out more talent. So there's a difference between having a lot of draft picks and having real talent. So what the players are basically saying is, you got these teams like Baltimore and Pittsburgh and Arizona last year that I'm not saying they're intentionally tanking it, but it makes you wonder, Padres, uh, why they're tanking because they want to get higher draft picks. This this is a, I guess you can say a uh, assumption, but it's pretty much, I think if you follow any sports, when teams do this, you're just like, ah, they're tanking so they get high draft picks next year. Fans don't like that anymore. Players don't like that. So that's part of the argument is we need to figure out how to stop the manipulation of service time. Uh, they want these players on the opening day roster. So these young talents, instead of manipulating their, their service time so the owners won't pay him as much, look at Chris Bryant. They didn't bring him up till later on in the season because they were manipulating his playing time so they can keep his money down. That's what the players are talking about. They want these top prospects on opening day. They don't want these top prospects just simmering in the minors until we can bring them up when it's cheaper for the owners players are going no man we if we're going to put competitive you know teams on the field we need to have access to all of our players and no more games playing with the money service time that's what they've agreed on or they've come into agreement so the fact that their owners are agreeing on top prospects starting earlier dh in playoffs it's a really good sign that they've agreed upon those things they're just tweaking it but the main thing right now for the owners is they just don't want to play, pay younger players more. It's still about revenue sharing. Uh, players, they don't want them having salary arbitration early. They don't want them going free agencies early after six years, which is weird. I think the free agency, free agent, free agency is perfect at six years. Um, the arguing of two years and three years being allowed for salary arbitration, I guess that's nitpicking at this point. But I mean, it is what it is. Um, so that's great. This meeting was initiated by MLB to uh, an effort to move a path for a new deal. Uh, they've met uh, on other issues in the weeks since the lockout began, but Thursday marks the first time since they discussed core economic issues. So it's just absolutely positive that they're at this point. They've been talking and they're getting close. I think they're really getting close because, again, you got to look at the language. There, there's nothing out there in this language that's saying, this isn't happening in 2022. Players are being greedy. Owners being, you know, you don't get either side and you don't get the leaks. You know, there's not a lot of leaks coming out out there. Even guys like Jeff Passan, I've been following him every day. There's no leaks coming out of the camp. So it's very interesting what's going on with the CBA. Um, again, you got fans panicking, thinking that we're not going to have baseball this year. Again, we've never had one regular season game missed due to the lockout. Strikes? Yes. Lockouts? No. I'm confident we're going to have baseball this year. Um, this is a good sign. This is a really good sign. If you read between the lines here, uh, the, they just are doing, they're doing a good job, I think, in my opinion, at least from what I'm reading. Uh, the union, they want to totally overhaul the sports economic system, uh, system, including three core components that have been part of the CBA for decades, the six-year free agency, like I said, Super 2 and revenue sharing. So those are the things they're trying to overhaul. Uh, and it's it's a lot. There's a lot to go over. We've, I've been reading the CBA to you guys for weeks. 
it's a lot to go over, but luxury tax is always something the owner is going to be pushing. Again, it's revenue sharing. And the but like I said, what I'm excited about is where they've come to common ground on the DH and extended playoffs. Again, both sides want these. There's zero reason why you wouldn't want playoffs expanded. There's zero reason, you know, why you, you wouldn't want these things to get through DH. It's going to make the game funner. I know some fans out there are pushing back on it, but what do you want? It's either we keep the DH or we get rid of it. Plain and simple. Let's move on. Now, talk about something else. Uh, I'm sorry about the background, guys. I'm working on that. Uh, I got a green scene, green screen created. It's out there last week. So I appreciate you guys not laughing at my background as much. Uh, we're going to fix it. It's getting better and better every week. Um, like I said before, I just dropped a lot of money on my technology to be able to come to you guys on YouTube. Uh, we're still on podcast, but you know, bear with us while as we go through this technology. I got my light here, got my background, but I'm gonna we're gonna be green screening it soon. It'll be a lot better, and we're gonna have guests. Now, I want to go into another area about players to be traded. Uh, there's some players on the top of the block that are gonna be good candidates for trade. I don't want to talk about it because I like him. Trey Mancini, uh, comeback player of the year last year. Um, he's only looking to make $7.9 million. I could see Baltimore, depending on what Baltimore is doing right now, getting rid of him just to save money. Again, I don't know what Baltimore is doing because they're not really going upwards. So he's a name that can be traded. Um, Bobby Dalbeck. Now, here's the interesting thing about Bobby. I know a lot of you Red Sox fans are like, what? We ain't get rid of Bobby. He's our boy. Yeah, where was your boy in the playoffs? Mm-hmm. I don't hear anybody chirping now. Again, comment on this. Let me read you something. Uh, Bobby Dobek had four at-bats against New York. He had six at-bats against Tampa in the ALDS. And then two at-bats against Houston. He had 12 at-bats with no hits, 5Ks, $575,000 salary. The guy played all season with you and went hit 25, 28 homers. He had a good productive season. Did not play him in the playoffs. Very, very interesting. Now, Boston was super hot, but the fact he couldn't hit three different teams, wild card, you know, all the way on through, ADLS or ALDS, ALCS, it's very interesting. And he's a cheap chip. He could be someone that can get good return back. But he's someone to look at. Cape Crip, or Craig Kimbrough of the White Sox. Justin Upton, absolutely, in LA Angels, due to make $28 million this year. Not worth it. Again, another one of the players that LA has overpaid. I mean, Rendon, Upton, Albert. Can't say Shohei. He's worth it. But um, we're going to talk about Mike Trout in a second. Also, Josh Donaldson. He's due to make $21 million for Minnesota. Uh, they can get rid of him and clear money out for younger talent, which Minnesota probably needs to do. Um, but somebody that's... Let's talk Mike Trout reason I want to talk, talk Mike Trout is what's going on with him this year. Uh, the GM for LA, Mike Minnison, said he's doing well and working out. That was just happened in December. Um, spring training is his target date. Okay, I want to get back into Mike Trout because this is, if you heard my prior podcast, it's been a big frustration for me. I, the way the Angels handled Mike Trout last year is confusing and it's frustrating. I mean, he went out on, what was it, May 17th with the calf strain. When you look at, I saw this guy on uh, Twitter who put out these statistics of calf strain length of uh, rehab or how long you're out. Calf strains only go two months, maybe three. And this, the way they played it out, it was a couple weeks to months, so it's going to be after the All-Star break. You know, this is what the Angels were saying, and now Mike's not even playing. So really, what's going on with Mike Trout? Is there some manipulation by the angels lying to the media i think so because nothing makes sense with mike trout right now um spring training is his target date now they're saying it's a target date spring training what the hell happened he got injured on may 17th last year a calf strain and now you're saying a target date target date means is we're hoping he's ready by this date and they're saying by spring training they're hoping he's ready what the hell is wrong with Mike Trout? I don't buy what the Angels are selling right now. I don't buy, and this is what's frustrating me, and this is what's frustrating the Players Association, is this is another form of manipulation. And I think the fans are sick of it. 
what is going on with his cap? Is LA using? And then they came out with something where, oh, Mike Trout's help him recruit young players. So the first thing that came to my mind is, are they using Mike Trout while he's injured to help them become a better team? What the? Dude, you can't do it on your own. Why can't you recruit players on your own? You know why? Because players around baseball look at what you've done since you've got pull holes and how you overpay and you're not a competitive team. Of course you're going to need help by Mike Trout. But again, are you using Mike Trout? I don't understand what's going on in L.A. I really don't. Um, dude. You suffered a calf strain on May 17th, and he's still, I'm just, I love Mike Trout. He's great for baseball. I just, like Albert Pujols, his year last year was not a really good exit for retirement. You saw what happened with his wife early in January of 2021. She announced his retirement. Then he immediately, within a few weeks, was like, oh, no, no, I'm not retiring. Then he's just bouncing around. I mean, he's playing in Lightham. He only batted 246 in the Dominican League, so it's just, I don't know what's going on. All I'm saying, LA Angels is a weird spot to play right now. Let's move on. Speaking of Lightem, let's talk about that. Now, right now, if you guys haven't been paying attention, I've been telling you about it for a while. Yesterday, Monday, was game one of the playoffs, the series finale with Lightem or the Dominican baseball. Uh, you got the Gigantes against the Estrellas. Um, last night was a great game. I watched it. It was 4 4 tie, extra innings. And the Estrellas ended up winning on a crazy wild throw by the catchers of the Gigantes. Now, when you look at who's on what team, Marcelo Zuna is on the Gigantes. They're one of the best hitting team in the league. And then you look over at the Estrellas, the coach is Tatis's dad. And if you watch the game last night, Fernando Tatis is in the dugout. He's not suited up. I told you guys last week's podcast how they talked about in December that he might be playing. I don't see him playing right now. I think it'd be kind of a rude move if you're to insert Tatis into the seven game finale right now. But game two is tonight. Um, there you go. Boop. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they have Thursday off, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday if necessary. So those are the games. Um, again, you got to check it out, man. A different venue. So every other day they switch venues. Uh, they do Titela Vargas last night. Today's uh, Julian Javier. Javier, excuse me, that's where they're going to be playing. So the home team will be the Gigantes, and then it switches back to Estrellas, and then uh, Gigantes, back and forth. So home field advantage goes to the Estrellas. They had a, they have the home field advantage. But again, there's baseball out there, guys. That's just $24 more on your MLB package. It's well worth it. I love watching these games, but that was a hell of a game last night, guys. You guys have to tune in and figure out how to watch that. Um, I don't know if you can get a VIP box. I'm always telling you guys about VIP box. It's probably going to be there too, but I have it on my MLB package, so I get to watch it there. So catch up to that, guys, because by the time I talk next week, we're going to have a, a Lightem champion. Uh, last year is the Guias. Uh, this year it's going to be the Gigantes or the Estrellas. So tune into that, guys. That is great baseball, and that's pretty much all we have right now, other than wiffle ball and blitz ball. But that's another thing I want to talk about. I've noticed there's not a lot of bullets ball leagues. I just see friends pitching to friends and excited that they can make the ball go like this and like that. Um, I see millions of wiffle ball leagues all over America. So it would be nice to see some blitz ball leagues. I'm just saying, if you're going to brag about it, get out there and start a league. Okay, what I want to go into next is how exciting baseball was last year. When you look at teams, let's just say June 8th. Let's start off with the American League East. You had Tampa Bay leading the way. Boston one and a half out, Yankees six and a half, uh, Toronto was seven. It was probably the most competitive division, arguably, in baseball. Look at the American League Central. White Sox were leading Cleveland by four games, still competitive. Kansas City was seven and a half out. Hey, man. Three out of the five teams right there, four out of the, four out of five in the East. And then when you look at the, the West, you have Oakland leading the way, Houston with a one game lead, Seattle six games out. Angel six and a half out. So four at, at June 8th, you had four, eight, 11 out of 15 teams competitive. I'm just saying, uh, you look at the National League East, you had the, the Mets were winning over at, or leading over Atlanta by three games, Philadelphia four and a half out, Miami and Washington seven and a half out. Not too bad. Uh, the Central, you have Milwaukee leading the way, Cubs half game before the fire sale. Uh, St. Louis was three and a half out. Cincinnati was five out. Again, four. I mean, pretty much the whole East was in it on June 8th. And then you have four or five in the Central. 
You look at the West, you had San Francisco, LA, uh, I mean, San Francisco, San Diego out by two and a half, and LA, three out. Arizona, man, just <laughs> 19 games out by June 8th. Dude, you got it. That's hard, man. That's hard. So let's go in a month later. Okay, let's look at a month later in the American League East. Boston had the lead. Tampa was two and a half out. And this was the point of the season where everyone was like, what's going on? Toronto and the Yankees, eight and nine games out. White Sox, this is pretty much since June to July, White Sox was just creating separation. It was an easy division for them. Cleveland was seven and a half out. You go into the American League West, you had Houston leading the way, Oakland four and a half out, and all of a sudden you see Seattle and L.A. tanking it. Uh, L.A. was nine games out at that point. Then you go over to the NL East. Uh, Mets took the, a bigger lead. They're four and a half over Philadelphia. Atlanta, five games out. Washington, five. And Miami tanking it. And then you look at uh, the Central just went downhill right away. Cincinnati was seven games out. And this is on July 8th, by the way. Uh, Cubs, nine and a half. St. Louis, nine and a half. And that's when I was almost like starting to look at St. Louis like you're done. Um, then you look at the West. Uh, four games out the Padres, one game out the Dodgers, because pretty much uh, the team that owned it was was uh, San Francisco in that division all year long. So let's look at August 8th. Who was in first place August 8th? American League East. Tampa had a four-game lead over Boston. Yankees six and a half out. Toronto seven. So again, competitive division. And then you look at the White Sox in the Central. They're just killing it. Ten and a half over Cleveland, which was the closest team. Uh, American League West. Houston leading the way. Oakland two out. Seattle seven and a half. Angels tanking it at 10 games out. And then, and a lot of you fans remember this, Philadelphia Phillies had a two-game lead over the Mets. Mm-hmm. Philadelphia had a two-game lead over the Mets August 8th. Uh, Atlanta was two and a half out. Washington, nine, so they were done, So, uh, And then you look at the NL Central. Cincinnati was five games out, still looking good, but St. Louis, 10 and a half. Cubs, of course, sinking like a, like a keg full of beer in the ocean. 14 and a half out, and then the same thing in the uh, National League West. It was the Dodgers and San Francisco going neck to neck. The Dodgers were four half, four out, but that's just where you start seeing the Padres start slipping down uh, the pipeline. They were uh, about seven games out, so they started to lose it. Now let's go September 8th. September 8th, American League East, Tampa Bay, nine game lead. Just created super separation. It's obviously at this point coming down the wild card for the Yankees, Toronto, and Boston. Boston was nine out, Yankees nine and a half. So Tampa Bay took that division. Uh, White Sox again had control of the West or Central, excuse me, uh, 11 games out. And then the AL West, uh, Houston had a five and a half game lead. Oakland started tanking it. Uh, Oakland was six out, and then Seattle's five and a half out here. And Angels, of course, 12 and a half. You had no chance. And then you look at the NL East. All of a sudden, Atlanta's in first place. Philadelphia's starting to tank it. They're two games out. Mets are three and a half out. There's, they're gonna. This is the point where the Mets start tanking it. Um, obviously, Miami, Washington, no, you, you didn't have a chance. Uh, Milwaukee, same thing. Cincinnati tanked it. Then you look at the NL West. San Francisco and LA still battling. Padres down 15 games. So it just goes to show within a short period how quick these teams went out of it. And then you look at September 30th. Of course, it was Tampa Bay leading the way. Uh, they clinched that division, so it left the Yankees, Boston, Toronto to a wild card. Uh, the White Sox already had that division. Cleveland wasn't going to get the wild card. Houston already got the division. Seattle still fighting for the wild card. Oakland eights out at this point. And then again, you look at the, the National League East. Atlanta had clinched the division. Philadelphia, five and a half out. Mets, ten and a half. Uh, and then you look at the Central, and this is where uh, NL Central, where St. Louis just went bonkers. There were six games out at this point. St. Louis was just ridiculously hot. Cincinnati fell off the radar. Uh, it's really, I mean, Cincinnati were 13 games out, but Cubs were 26. I mean, just tanking it. And the Padres were 27 games out at this point. So it's just, teams just went downhill. But you can see the progression throughout the season, how the teams did each month. So it was pretty fabulous to follow up. But my point that I'm trying to tie into the CBAs and what the players are talking about is having a competitive team on the field i need to sign into this real quick so throwing teams on the field to be competitive was a super important team and that's what they're talking about with the cba that's why they're talking about revenue sharing uh, that's why the players are wanting more money for younger players and why the owners don't want to give it you saw a better competitive sport i think 2021 was a great season and all i gotta say is major league baseball is you're on a roll don't 
lose fans now. You have a great thing going, but to strike, or I mean not strike, but to miss any regular season games this year is not a good thing. Major League Baseball needs to come out strong when they announce the CBA. And when they come out, they're going to be like, hey, we got DH, we got playoffs. 2022, if they can open it up where we can see some spring training and start our regular season on time, I think this is going to be a great, great season. I really do. Um, how can it not be? Look at 2021. It Baseball's back. And we're going to have the Field of Dreams this year. I mean, everything. It's going to be epic. So, again, please comment. Thank you for listening. Please download um, this this podcast. Check us out on IG, Ball and Play, Baseball News Club. But mainly check out our YouTube channel, Baseball News Club. Uh, this is Sesma signing out. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And again, this is going to get better every week. It's not going to be this. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing this every week with you guys. I'm going to have a green screen. Slowly but surely. I promise you guys by the start of the season we're going to have a great show. Again, please tell your friends. Thanks for listening to Ball and Play.